and it's so nice to see you ladies here to see your names it always does my heart good to see you all so i'm going to minimize that see if i can get you all. oh more people are coming in yay cindy's here Okay, so let's pray and get started with our final lesson. I was going to go to eight weeks, but then I remembered this is my last Thursday, and then I have two weeks off for Christmas. So this is our final lesson in Jonah, our Mercy in the Storm study of the book of Jonah, lesson seven. So let's pray and dive in. Father God, you are so merciful in your love for us. And as we read through the book of Jonah, we are reminded how compassionate you are and that you want even the wicked, the most wicked people to repent. And we thank you, Lord, that we were once part of those people. And now we are new in Christ because of you. I pray that you would just speak to the ladies here today with the story of Jonah and my personal story that, that hearts will be changed, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. That's the, the dream is for hearts to be changed by studying God's word. Now, last time we looked at how Jonah obeyed God's second commission. Remember, he immediately went. And this time we're going to continue to look at jo Jonah's response and Nineveh's response and how Jonah reacted to that. Remember, we also looked at how God reacts when a wicked person repents. Doesn't it make you feel good to know we serve such a compassionate God that he gives us chances to repent? So we're going to look, continue to look at Jonah in Nineveh. Remember, he went into this city and told them, you have 40 days to repent. And they did. And not just that, but they really mourned their sin with sackcloth, sackcloth and ashes. They really mourned what they had done. So praise God for that. Well, God saw that. He saw what they did and how they turned from their evil way. So God relented from the disaster that he had said he would do to them. He did not do it. There's that mercy, the mercy of God. So we see how a great wicked city of Nineveh repented and it pleased the Lord. Amen. So I want to, in our lesson that I sent out, I wanted to, I, I wrapped up the story, my personal story of when I was pregnant. And how they told me if I stayed in bed and obeyed orders that our son would be born. But they said that he would be very, very small, very weak from all the narcotics that I had to take. But God fooled them all. And on April 18th, our son was born, not little, not weak, but eight pounds, 11 ounces and 21 inches long. He was chubby and pink and beautiful. He, I mean, all the doctors were just stunned. They called him the miracle baby. And as they put him in the bassinet in my room, my hospital room, all about all the 12 doctors who had been on my case through the whole time came to see him one by one. And they would knock on my door and say, I came to see the miracle baby. And I'd say, there he is. And they just marveled because they thought for sure he was going to be so sick. But God, God performed a miracle. Our son was wide awake. He stared right at me and I fell in love with him. And since I had already been talking to him in the womb, we already knew each other. And that final, finally, that hectic, crazy pregnancy, 20 weeks in bed was over and God blessed the fruit of all that labor and our precious boy. Now, when I first went in to find out why I was having so much pain way back, at like, I think I was 10 weeks along, that's when they found that I had this large tumor and they said, you're going to be a high risk pregnancy. And I remember as I was putting my clothes back on, the nurse said to me, you know, you can always terminate the pregnancy and have them remove the tumor and then get pregnant after that. And when she said that, I was like, wow terminate the pregnancy. We all know what that meant. And that was my worldview. It was staring at me in the face. Because back then I was very much pro-choice. And the nurse was right. I live in a country where it's perfectly legal. And I did have that choice. But deep inside, I knew I could never terminate the life of my unborn child. I just knew I couldn't do it. So I didn't say anything to her. I just listened. But then after my son was born, I looked back on that moment 
And I'm so glad I didn't listen to that lady because look at what I would have missed. My little boy, he was so beautiful and he would smile at me and flirt with me. And he was just such a joy to be around. And there he is going off to kindergarten, that face. He is looking you know, like he does all the time at his goofy parents. We couldn't even figure out how to work the camera. And I just look back on all the fun times we've had, the vacations we've had, the joy he brings us all the time. And I would have missed all of that if I had listened to that nurse. You see, nine months after our son was born, I had surgery to remove all the tumors. And the doctor said, you can have more children. So I was so excited. But then six months later, all the tumors returned and they returned in a very, very bad place. So I went to four different doctors and they told me, no, more children will not be possible. In 1994, I had asked the Lord for a family, three sons, I asked him, and God said, no. He said, one son, be content with that. Be content with what I have given you. So if I had listened to that nurse, you know, I went through a deep depression after that. I'm not going to lie. I was 28 years old, healthy, right? I should have been able to have six kids. And I really felt that my own body had disappointed me. I felt that God was being unfair. But God, through counseling, he helped me. And in his love and faithfulness, he healed my mind as well as my body. And he taught me to say, I am content with what the Lord has given me, one son, our only son. And that's what I think so many young women don't understand today. They are thinking like I did. Yeah, sure, I'll terminate this pregnancy. And then when I meet Mr. Wright, I'll fall in love, we'll get married, and I'll have six kids. And that's what I thought. I always thought I'm healthy, I'm young, I'll have a bunch of kids. But sometimes... The answer is no. So had I listened to that nurse all those years ago, I would have terminated the life of my only son with the mindset that, oh, I'll just have more children. So you just never know what's going to happen, but God does know. And that's just what Jonah didn't understand, did he? He knew who God was, but they didn't have a close personal relationship, did they? So instead of being joyful about Nineveh turning and from their wicked ways, right? Jonah was angry and that displeased, it displeased God. But when Jonah saw that the people repented, he was angry. Isn't that awful? He witnessed a miracle and that was his response. <clears throat> so I could have been angry at God when God said no more children. I could have said, oh, I'm so angry with you. Instead, the Lord helped me to be content. And that's what Jonah needed to do. He was angry and he prayed to the Lord, Oh Lord, is not this what I had said when I was in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish <clears throat> for what? I knew that you are gracious and merciful and slow to anger. Talk about irony, right? He, Jonah was quick to anger, but he knew God was slow to anger. And he knew that God was abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. I, I just can't even compre comprehend that. If I found out that all these members of the MS-13 gang repented and became men of God and were out there giving the gospel message to other gang members, would I be angry about that? No, I would praise God for that. But that's what Jonah was. He was angry at God for not doing what he wanted him to do. He was angry at God for showing mercy. He should have been rejoicing, but he wasn't. And I know sometimes for Christians, forgiveness is a very, very difficult concept. It was for me. I held on to a grudge for many, many years. I was taught how to do that by my mom. And my sister, I mean, oh, my goodness, they were like world champion grudge holders. And they both left this earth with grudges. They still had resentment in their hearts when they died. And so I could easily hold on to a grudge for years and years. But God has showed me over the years to learn to let go, to forgive and let go. 
And so many people think, well, when you forgive, then that means you, you know, you're giving the person a free pass. And that's kind of what my mom used to think. And that's not true. When you are saying, I forgive this person, you're saying, you owe me nothing. Debt is paid. You owe me nothing, no more. But that doesn't mean you have to become best friends with the person that hurt you. No, not at all. It's like our, our former pastor used to say, if you find out that your accountant embezzled hundreds of thousands of dollars from you, you would fire him, right? And you would forgive him. But that doesn't mean you have to keep him on as your accountant. No, you fire him and you say goodbye. It's the same thing with forgiveness. You can forgive that person and say goodbye. And that's just one of the consequences that they have to deal with, that you are no longer in their life. And that's okay. As long as you can say to yourself and to God, that person owes me nothing anymore. No apologies, no begging forgives, nothing. They owe me nothing. And that was just a concept that my mom really struggled with. She just didn't understand that. To her, forgiving someone meant you're giving them a free pass. Not true. So before that, I go into this next part. In my lesson, I shared a powerful story that I heard years ago. There was a restaurant in Arizona, in Phoenix, called Gooseberry's Tea Room. And one time at a women's retreat, I heard the owner of that restaurant tell her story. Her 16-year-old son, her only son, had been killed in a drive-by shooting. And it was tragic. And she just didn't understand how this could happen. So she went to the trial, and when she saw who the defendant was, the man that they arrested, he was only 19 years old, and she was just flooded with compassion because she thought, wow, my son was killed by a kid himself. I mean, this, this guy was just from a gang all his life. That's all he knew. So when he was sentenced to about 25 years in prison, she went up to his attorney and she said, do you think you could get me permission to where I could write letters to him? And the attorney was like, yeah, I'll see what he says. Well, months and months went by and she finally heard from the attorney and he said, yeah, my client says that you can write to him in prison, but he said he's not going to answer you. And she said, okay. So she wrote all these letters to him, wrote all these letters to him, sharing the gospel message, talking about her son and never heard back from this young man. So months later, she went to the attorney and she said, do you think he would allow me to visit him? in the prison. And the attorney was like, ma'am, I don't know what your plan is. Why do you want to do that? And she said, I have my reasons. So he said, okay, let me ask him and see what he says. Well, to her shock, the young man agreed for her to go visit him. So she did. When he came in, he was all chained and bound and he sat down on the other side of the glass and she proceeded to tell him about her son. And she held out pictures of her son from birth to kindergarten to sixth grade to high school. And she said, this is my son. I want you to know who he was. And then she showed the autopsy photo of his body on the slab. And the man who murdered her son turned away. And she said, no, 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 you don't turn away. I have to look at this picture, so you have to look at this picture of my son, whom you killed. And with tears streaming down his face, the young man looked at the picture of her dead son, the boy that he had killed. And then she said, I want you to know I forgive you. I forgive you for what you did because Jesus Christ has forgiven me. And she shared the gospel message with him. Now, miracle didn't happen that day, but time after time, she kept going back to visit him and ask him questions about his home life. And she found out that he pretty much was raised into the gang. That's all he knew. And that night he was being, um, he had to shoot and kill someone in order to be, I forget what they call it, but brought into the gang. And unfortunately, her son was his victim. So she kept visiting him and visiting him until one day he bowed his head and ask Jesus into his life. So you see what I'm saying? She could have just held that grudge forever, but she didn't. She had compassion, just like Jesus did. Compassion on the person who hurt her the most. Praise God. Only God can do that. And that's what she says. She goes, only God can do that. 
So God said to Jonah, do you do well to be angry? Why are you angry? Right? I just don't understand that. And you might say, oh, Ruth, you don't know what this evil person did to me. I can't possibly forgive this person. And you're right. Without Jesus, you can't. But with Jesus, you can do all things. All things are possible. God relented against Nineveh because it says in Ezekiel, he gets no pleasure from the death of the wicked. So cast all your cares to God because he loves you and he understands what you're going through. But Jonah, he didn't even answer God. God asked him a question, and he just ignored God. And Jonah went out of the city, sat to the east of the city, and made a booth for himself there. And he sat under it in the shade till he could see what would become of the city. So it's almost like he wanted God to destroy this city. So we see the condition of Jonah's heart. And I love this uh, rendering, this this image of Jonah that I found online, because it really looks like he's waiting. He's waiting for God to just wipe out this nation. But no, God relented in his compassion and mercy because Nineveh mourned their sin and that pleased God. But God provides. So Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade Till he could see what would become of the city. Now the Lord appointed a plant and made it to come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to ease him from the discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad. Why? Because of God? No, because of the plant. Oh, Jonah. So here we see that he made a booth. And the word booth here is Sukkoth. And it refers to the Feast of Tabernacles. So perhaps, we don't know, but perhaps the author of Jonah wanted the Jewish people to reflect back on the Feast of Tabernacles when God said to Moses, speak to the people of Israel, saying on the 15th day of the seventh month and for seven days in the Feast of Booths to the Lord. They were to make a booth to commemorate their time wandering in the desert. We see that in Leviticus 23. Jonah built the booth, not to honor God, not for commemoration, but for himself, for his own comfort. We see in this verse that Jonah had no problem receiving the blessings of God through the plant, right, for himself. But he was angry toward God when those blessings were bestowed upon Nineveh. That's irony, right? He is a man of God. He just sat on that hill waiting for God to destroy the city and 100,000 people within the walls. That's the condition of his heart. He held on to that hatred and resentment and withheld the truth from the people of Nineveh. He withheld the knowledge of the one true God from a mighty nation. God's test, right? The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me, even when we fail. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm. And it devoured the little plant that Jonah cared about. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind. And the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. There's that hyperbole, right? <laughs> So here we see God again using nature. He used it with the storm. He used it with the fish. And now he's using it again, the sun and the wind, to get Jonah's attention. And Jonah instead focuses on himself again. Why do you think God allowed the little plant to die and nature to torment Jonah? Yet again, right? He did it once before, so now he was doing it again. Well, sometimes that's just what God does. I know for me, he wanted me in that bed during my pregnancy so that he could get my attention. And it worked. He got my attention. He needed for me to learn that each little life inside the womb was crucial, was his creation, was precious to him. 
So I tell the story in the lesson about the next day, April 19th, 1995, when we took our son home, was the day of the Oklahoma City bombing. So on the news, I saw the reports that Timothy McVeigh had parked a truck with a gigantic bomb inside of it right outside of a daycare center. And I thought, what does that to a person's heart that turns it into such a heart of stone? Talk about wicked, right? He knew. It wasn't by accident. I read a book about it. And he knew that the daycare center was there. He wanted as much collateral damage, as he called it, as possible to get attention from government. What causes someone's heart to become so hardened like that? So I wept. I watched the news reports. I watched the mothers crying. And I wept. But God was still working on my heart because here I had anger toward you know, McVeigh, and I had such sadness and sorrow for these little children who were killed, but yet in my worldview, I didn't care about little children inside the womb. I only cared about outside the womb. And the Lord was just working and working on my heart through all these circumstances. So after I saw the little baby the little girl being carried out by the firemen and she was dead. I wept and it just made me hold my son that much tighter. But God, he wanted me to see that my son inside the womb was just as precious as my son outside the womb. So he was working on me and working on me. So Jonah, so God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And I think God was trying to show him, like he was trying to show me, that the lives of the people in Nineveh were souls. And they were much more important to him than the plant. But remember what Paul wrote in Romans, that we tend to worship the creation rather than the creator. We worship living things over God. So God. The Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 people who do not know their right hand from their left and also much cattle? Those are the last words in the book of Jonah. So it really hit me hard because I was saying to God, a life doesn't matter until it's born. But God was showing me throughout my pregnancy, no, a life begins at conception. He was alive inside of you, rolling around, kicking, had the hiccups, would suck his thumb, right? He would sleep with his little hands under his face like that, which he did at age two and age three. So God was really working on my heart. And I see here the similarities. Jonah was more concerned with himself and his own comfort than he was with this 120,000 people. Oh, my goodness. They had come to a knowledge of God and were saved. And instead of praising God, Jonah questioned him yet again. That is, those are powerful words from the creator. God wanted Jonah to see the value of all human life. And that was the message that God had for me too. I wept over the loss of those little children in Oklahoma, yet I had no no pity in my heart for the unborn. And God wanted me to see that the lives inside the womb mattered just as much as the lives outside the womb. It took being bedridden, being in the hospital, being in excruciating pain, I can't even describe, being uncertain of the future, being in constant fear and anxiety for God to get my attention. And it worked. God worked on my heart. He had a purpose for me. Life application. Discovering God's purpose for your life. As we end this amazing story of Jonah, how can we apply all that we've learned so far? Well, let's take a look at what we've learned so far. God is sovereign. 
And our lives would be so much better if we realize this and accept it as fact. Don't fight against it, but accept it as fact. God pursues us. Oh my goodness, yes, he pursues us. So when he commands us to do something, we must do it, ladies. We must. God is merciful toward us. He gives us second, third, fourth chances. And God is compassionate. Even when our sin affects others and costs them much, God is compassionate and shows mercy. Like I said, I had this unconfessed sin in my heart that was changing my worldview. It no longer aligned with God's word. It was affecting my marriage. It was affecting my unborn son. It was affecting my mother-in-law who had to drive me to the hospital every week. It was affecting so many people around me. And if I had just got it out, it would have been so much better. But God had to work on my heart. And that's what happens, right? That's what happens. We need to remember our actions don't just affect us. We learned also that God is in control over everything. So don't fight it. He can use us even when we have failed him. And he still uses us despite our sin. He has a purpose. He sees us. His will is perfect, not ours. And God will test us because he cares about us. And I share about how um, it worked. God got my attention. And as our son grew, um, you know, I started studying God's word again. I started getting excited, but we remained in that status quo of just going to church, attending Bible study, and then I would do whatever I wanted to do during the week go to church on Sunday, attend Bible study on Wednesday, and then be about my business. And I kept doing that, kept doing that. Even though my worldview was starting to realign back to God's and got what God's word says, it was still working and working. God needed to show me one more thing. And that happened on September 15th, 1999. My college roommate, Sidney Browning, was shot and killed. I'm going to try not to get emotional. A madman walked into Wedgwood Baptist Church on a beautiful Wednesday evening in September. I don't know what possessed him, but many people feel it was the devil. He walked into that church and was um, asked a question by Sydney Browning. She said, can I help you with something? And he shot and killed her and shot at several other women in the Bible study. And then he went into the sanctuary and he shot up a whole bunch of people there, sat down and then killed himself. And uh, it was really difficult to get that phone call when my friend called me to tell me what had happened. My first thoughts were, how could God allow this to happen? A church shooting for crying out loud. Why God, why did you allow this to happen? And what were you thinking? I just didn't understand how this could happen. You see, Sydney Browning wasn't just an ordinary Christian woman. She had decided not to marry, uh, to be single so that she could serve God. And uh, she worked with troubled teens here in Phoenix and then decided to get her master's degree in uh, the seminary in Dallas, Fort Worth. And she decided to teach at one of the most crime-ridden schools in the nation because she just had a heart for these kids. And so she did. And she worked with them, even though many of them were in gangs and such. She didn't care. She loved them. And after the Columbine shooting, they did like a round table discussion because she knew that they were really troubled about what had happened in Columbine in in April 1999. And so she heard what they had to say. And they asked her, Would you take a bullet for us, Ms. Browning? And she said, Yes, without hesitation. She said, Yes, for a couple of reasons. She said, Number one, I'm the only one here who has health insurance. And number two, I'm the only one here who would go to heaven because I know Jesus. (laughs) And that's just how she was. She had that wit. But her students loved her. So I just didn't understand, you know, here she was working with the youth choir at church. She was there that night to teach Bible study. 
And that's where God called her home at age 36. Why? Why would he do that? I just don't get it. She was on fire for Christ. And he took her at age 36 when she was in the middle of powerful ministry. Why? I don't know. But I do remember at her funeral service, it was amazing. There were over a thousand people there. They had a huge memorial service there in Dallas, Fort Worth, where Stephen Curtis Chapman came to sing there. But then they had a personal memorial service for her here in Phoenix. And we went to that one. There were over a thousand people there. And person after person got up to speak about her and this amazing ministry and the, how many lives she touched. And it, it was just amazing. I just sat there in that service like a big pile of nothing. I thought, you, I just can't believe this. She did everything for the Lord. And even many of her students prayed to receive Jesus after she was shot and killed. And that's when the Holy Spirit asked me a question. What have you done, Ruth, to further God's kingdom? And I just sat there. And I said, nothing. I've been like Jonah, just worrying about myself. That's it. And look at what Sydney was doing. She was living a life for Jesus. Ladies, when God calls us home, don't we want to be caught doing something to further his kingdom, like teaching God's word? I do. I don't want to be caught watching Netflix or just walking the dog. Or wallowing in self-pity. I want to be caught doing something to further God's kingdom. And that was it. That was the catalyst that changed my life. It took all those years from 1994 to 1999. God was working on my heart. And I just knew there's a purpose for all of this. And that's when I started to look back over that time in bed and when I was pregnant. And I thought, now I'm starting to get what God was doing. It changed my walk with, with, um, with God. And I didn't just study God's word anymore. I devoured it. I bought books about God's word. I watched videos about God's word. I went to Bible studies and I asked so many questions. I just couldn't get enough of it. I just had to learn God's word. My eyes were wide open. I saw things in the book of Ruth I never noticed before. I saw things in the book of Jonah, things in the book of Exodus. I started going through the book of Revelation. Oh, my goodness. I saw Jesus and God's word for the first time. I saw that Jesus and God are one, and it changed my life. And I just couldn't be quiet. I had to tell others what I was learning. And that's when God said, I want to use you, but I can't until you get that sin out. It's like this beautiful bowl that someone gives you and you look inside and it's just full of gunk. You want to use it, right? But it has to be cleaned first. So I was this vessel mended by God, but I needed to be washed out first. And I finally finally confessed that sin that I had been walking in sexual sin the whole time I was in college. It shocked my family because they didn't know, <laughs> but I had to confess it to friends because I was pretending to be someone I wasn't, but God started to use my story. And I started to hear from other women who were like me too. Oh my goodness. Me too. I was pretending to be someone that I wasn't. And God started to use my story. And my life after that was never the same. I wish I can say, oh, everything was great after that. No, as many of you know, I've gone through many tests and trials and storms. But I had never again experienced silence from God, never. Like I did that time when I was in the hospital crying out to him, I heard nothing. When I was at home in in bed, scared for my unborn child, I heard nothing from God. And I've never experienced that again. His voice is as clear to me, even when I'm doing something wrong. <laughs> and my friend Jackie will attest to that. I've told her, I've heard God tell me, you are doing something wrong. And I just glorify him 
because at least he's talking to me, right? <laughs> so I praise God for that. So I can tell you, I lived it. First John 1, verses 6 through 7 are truth, because I lived it. If we say we have fellowship with God while we walk in darkness, we are liars. We are lying, and the truth is not in us. We are not practicing truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we can have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness. I'm here to tell you, ladies, that verse, those two verses are absolute truth. So once I confessed it all, the Lord said, now I can use you. And I received that newness of life. And that's the message of the book of Jonah that I want you to take away with you. So the book of Jonah ends in, John, in, in chapter four. Have you ever wondered what chapter five would have been like? I often do. Maybe Jonah finally got it. I don't know. Maybe we see Jonah heading back home, telling the story of what had happened to Nineveh. And maybe a lot of the people rejoiced. And maybe a lot of the people in Jerusalem were just as angry as he was. We don't know, but I can tell you how my chapter five is. And my chapter five is God continued to work on me. I started to see how ridiculous I was being, caring more about the plant rather than, right, God. And I started to learn that I have a purpose on this life, a purpose on earth, and that is to further the kingdom of God with my story. It's a painful, difficult story. I don't get pleasure from retelling it <laughs> because I remember the pain and the darkness and the separation from God. But I tell this story because if it keeps one woman from making the same mistake that I did, I would go through it all over again. I would go through it all over again. So that's my message for you. And that's the message in the book of Jonah. Newness of life. God is compassionate. God loves us. Oh my goodness. He's calling us. He's calling you. He's equipping you. He's preparing you according to his purpose. Those are the lessons that we can take when we write our final chapters. Know who God is and don't fight against it. Accept his rule over your life. Obey God immediately and without fear because he loves you and he has purpose for your life. And go and tell a broken world about the healing of the gospel message, about repentance and peace and restoration, newness of life. And find rest, ladies, in God's mercy and compassion for your life. And also be compassionate to others as God has been compassionate to us. Forgive, rejoice when the wicked repent before our holy God and love others the way that Jesus loved you. That's the lesson that I get from the book of Jonah. What is God doing in your heart today? Think about that. Does it feel icky because you're convicted? Are you rejoicing because you're like, yes, I have that newness too. How is this study of the book of Jonah? What is it revealing to you about God's work in your life? Do you have some of that unrepentant sin, that sin that you've Push down and push down because you just don't want to say it. Get it out. That's the only thing I can tell you is get it out today. That's the message in this beautiful book of Jonah. A little book I read so many times in my life. Oh, my goodness, since I was a little girl. And I just can't get enough of it because it points us to the saving power of Jesus. The better Jonah. Remember, he said a greater Jonah is here. He was a prophet and he failed, but God kept using him, right? In the midst of his sin, God still performed an amazing act. In the midst of my, my sin, God still performed a miracle in our son and then in my heart. And then now he's using me to do a good work. And I just can't help but glorify God and I will glorify him till the day I die. So until next time, thank you for joining me on this amazing journey through the book of Jonah. I hope you have been as blessed as I have been. And I just am always so grateful to see your faces here. <laughs> 
Oh, thank you. Yeah, you know, sometimes we are just so convicted, but we have to remember that God is speaking to us and getting that stuff out for a good reason. He wants to use us. And if we can be used as he used Sydney, my friend, then praise God, right? In our next Bible study that begins in January, I believe it's January 6th. Let me think. Do, do, do. Let me see. Uh, yes, January 6th, we are going to start looking at the gospel message. I had the pleasure of going to Billy Graham's uh, Evangelical Association conference with my husband because he a, is a chaplain and a discipleship coach with the BEA. G, I think, <laughs> I forget what it is, um, with Billy Graham, and they went through the gospel message with us, and it was so basic, but as they did, I was like, wow, I haven't studied the gospel message in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in so many years, and the leader there who was teaching us said, sometimes we just need to go back to the basics, like in football, sometimes they pull out the football, and they talk to the players, and they say, this is a football. <laughs> and today we're going back to the basics. And sometimes you just need to do that. So we went through a booklet of four lessons. And so this will just be a four week Bible study that we will begin. And we're going to go through the gospel. And after it's done, I'm telling you, you are going to want to share the gospel message with others. It, it just lit a fire in me. And that's why I'm so excited to share it with you too. So I hope that I'll see you on January sixth yes january 6th in 2022 until then thank you ladies let's pray and say goodbye but i wish you all a blessed merry christmas and a happy new year and again thank you for your faithfulness in joining me on these bible studies god thank you lord jesus for your beauty your grace your compassion that you have on us and that your compassion never fails your mercies and your compassion are new every morning and thank you for being faithful to us, even when we have been unfaithful to you. Lord, you are such a blessing to us, and we love you so much. And you alone are worthy of our praise and our worship and our admiration, Lord. And we thank you. I thank you for each lady here, Lord. You know what's happening in her life. Go to her, Lord. Let her know that you see her, that you love her. And for those listening, Lord, remind them that you are the God who sees and the God who provides. And Lord, please go to them and let them know that you love them and that you will provide for them no matter what happens. And until next time, Lord, be blessed in Jesus name. Amen. Thanks, ladies. Merry Christmas. You're welcome. Merry Christmas. <laughs>